Well, friends, we're going to continue this morning in our study in the Gospel of Matthew, and we are, as a matter of fact, uh, Todd has led us into this. In Matthew chapter 4, uh, we're going to begin reading here in verse 12 in just a couple of minutes. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, if you don't have a Bible with you, feel free to grab one uh, from the chair back in front of you that's yours to use today, that's yours to take home if you wish. Matthew chapter 4. So friends, our passage today this morning really does represent the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. He has gone through the baptism. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He walked through that process. He came out the other side, and now our passage marks the moment when Jesus begins to preach and teach in the countryside and go public, if you want to use that kind of language. And as we think about this passage of Scripture, I want us to keep these ideas in mind as we watch what happens with Jesus Christ and his disciples. First of all, Jesus' ministry begins in a surprising place. We will read that Jesus actually leaves the region of Jerusalem and makes his way north through the region of Galilee. Jesus had been baptized outside of Jerusalem in the region of Jordan and moved further in the wilderness through the temptation at the beginning of the chapter. And now he moves away from the metropolis, Jerusalem, to the region of Galilee to begin to preach. And it is a surprising place to begin But Matthew lets us know that as Jesus does it, it actually fulfills God's original plan. Secondly, the message of Jesus Christ is clear. In fact, it is as clear as the message of John the Baptist. When Jesus begins preaching, he begins with the same message that we heard when we were introduced to John the Baptist at the beginning of chapter 3. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus preaches this, and now with the added detail, friends, that he is the one who is bringing this kingdom of God. So his message is clear. And then finally, this thought, the call of Jesus Christ is clear. In this passage, Jesus begins to gather disciples to himself with the very simple call, follow me. And it is this call this call that is initiated by Jesus Christ, that he speaks to his children, that makes discipleship possible. It is this call initiated by Jesus Christ that makes life in his kingdom possible. Friends, in this passage this morning, we're going to have to start wrestling with this notion of what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. And we begin to hear a little bit about what that means and I think be challenged by the reactions of the disciples to Jesus. So let's begin reading Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 12. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And this really is a powerful passage. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, to the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As the passage opens, we are told that John the Baptist is thrown into prison. Now, John the Baptist is thrown into prison by one of the Herods. I believe it's Herod Antipas. Herod the Great, the Herod of the first couple of chapters of Matthew. He's now dead and gone, and one of his successors is on the throne. And John the Baptist now languishes in prison from this point until his death. And we will run into John the Baptist again, but it is absolutely clear And again, I am a fan of John the Baptist in so many ways. It is absolutely clear that John the Baptist's message has rubbed the leadership in Jerusalem in all the wrong ways. And sometimes that just happens when someone steps into the public square and begins to preach the things of Jesus Christ. Well, this is what has happened to John the Baptist, and sure enough, he finds himself in prison because of it. 
At about the same time, the text tells us that Jesus makes his way to Galilee. He begins to go north into the region of his boyhood home, the little village, the town of Nazareth. And you've, you can see it in the backs of your Bibles and the maps. We've got a little bit of information there behind you, so you can kind of follow this just a little bit. Jesus goes to the city of Nazareth, and then the text tells us he makes his way to live in the city of Capernaum. Small little town, they're right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And throughout the rest of the Gospels, Jesus keeps coming back to the city of Capernaum. In a lot of ways, this actually starts to act like his home base through the next three years of his ministry before the cross. As Matthew describes, what Jesus does is he moves north to the region of Galilee is that Jesus is here in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, if you take a New Testament map like this, and you overlay it with the Old Testament map that is in the back of your Bible, the tribes, two of the 12 tribes, are Zebulun and Naphtali, and they settled in the northern region that here is known as Galilee. So these two regions overlap. Matthew tells us where he is now, and he connects it to the Old Testament. So Jesus leaves the region around Jerusalem. Now this is interesting because Jerusalem is the religious and the cultural center of Israel. And he goes to Galilee, a place full of a lot of small little villages to actually begin his ministry. Now Jesus will be back to Jerusalem and he will make his impact in the city of Jerusalem. But this is a surprising place for Jesus to begin for several reasons. Galilee does not have the best reputation in all of Israel. If you live in the city of Jerusalem, if maybe you've received the kind of education that belongs to the city of Jerusalem, you look down just a little bit on the region of Galilee. They might be a little undereducated. At one point, when one of the disciples comes to tell his brother that Jesus has come, the Messiah has come out of Nazareth, his brother responds, can anything good even come out of the village of Nazareth? Now, as you have seen on the map, Galilee, that region, is surrounded by Gentile nations. And so, over the generations, we actually have kind of a mixed race of people inside of Galilee. And if you're a good Jewish Pharisee or rabbi or scribe, again, you look down on people who are a little bit alike that. We go a little bit further back into the Old Testament, and we think of Zebulun and Naphtali, the tribes that Matthew reminds us of. And in the Old Testament, those two tribes in the north suffered greatly as their enemies would come down from the north. Because they are on the northern border, that's often where the invaders would come through first, maybe not making their way all the way south, but they always get to Zebulun and Naphtali. So this is a group of people historically who have suffered a lot, and are even looked down on inside of their culture. And yet Matthew tells us that this move by Jesus fulfills Old Testament prophecy about the coming of the Messiah, how he comes, why he comes, and even to the people that he comes. And so he pulls from Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2. If you would turn with me there, I want to read a couple of passages out of Isaiah 9, because as Matthew quotes a couple of passages from Isaiah 9. He's not just thinking about these phrases as powerful as they are. He's thinking about the entire story that's given to us in Matthew chapter 9. So, excuse me, in Isaiah chapter 9. So in Isaiah 9, the first two verses say this. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he was brought into contempt, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, often because of the rebellion of the people of God. But in the latter times, what will happen next, Isaiah says? But in the latter times, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. Friends, think this is the passage that Matthew grabs to describe the coming of Jesus Christ. People who have suffered greatly, people who live in darkness, people who live in this kind of special unwanted status, even inside of their own culture, people who dwelt in deep darkness, Jesus walks into that life and turns on the light. What a powerful image of what it means for Jesus to show up 
light coming into this darkness. This region full of people who sit in darkness will see a great light, Isaiah says. Jesus comes to a people who are poorly regarded by many and who have suffered much, and Jesus brings great light. Now again, Matthew is thinking of the entire story of Matthew 9. Excuse me, Isaiah 9. So let's continue reading in Isaiah 9 to think about what Matthew is thinking about. Isaiah 9, verse 3. Listen again to what it means for Jesus to come. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. The, the poetry, even in the English translation, is just, I think, so beautiful and powerful. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. When Jesus comes, these things start to change. These things that are so common inside of the human condition begin to change because light has dawned on those who live in darkness. Well, this is glorious, but this is still not the end of the story. Isaiah continues. But to us, a child is born. A son is given. And the government, now remember the message that Jesus preaches when he shows up. And Matthew says, this is what it reminds me of. Jesus is preaching what? Repent, for the government of God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there shall be no End. Imagine that, <laughs> that of the increase of the kingdom of God. And how does this work? I don't know how this works, but man, I look forward to watching this work. Of the increase of his peace. You and I watch constantly the increase of tumult and of bloodshed and of pain. But when the kingdom of God has its way, peace will increase forever. Isn't that amazing? And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal, the desire of the Lord will perform it. God will do it. Isn't that beautiful? Christ has come, light has shone in darkness, and Matthew uses this powerful passage from Isaiah to introduce us to the coming of the government of God, the coming of the kingdom of God, the coming of the place in which Christ has his way. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the message that John the Baptist preached in the wilderness, and we, in chapter 3, we sat and we soaked inside of that message, that the repentance, the turning from my sin is the open door into the new life offered to me by God, for the kingdom of God is now at hand. And when John the Baptist preaches that, it's a, it, it's, it's a message of confession of sin. One human being is telling another group of human beings, repent, for his kingdom is actually on its way. It's nearby. When Jesus preaches the message, it is a message of confession of sin Plus, it is a call to follow the one who is doing the preaching. Guys, this is important. When John the Baptist preaches this message, he's pointing to Jesus Christ. When I preach that kind of message, I am pointing to Jesus Christ. God knows, please don't look at me. <laughs> I am not pointing to me. When anybody preaches this message, they're pointing to Jesus Christ, except for Jesus Christ. When he comes preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it's as if Jesus is saying, and here it is. And I'm going to start calling you to follow me. He is the coming of the kingdom. In Jesus, it is at hand. So friends, Jesus does not point to another greater figure. 
Jesus is not a mere prophet. Jeremiah, when he speaks, he's, he points to another person. Isaiah, when he speaks, he's pointing to one who is greater than he is. That's not what Jesus does. He's not a mere prophet. When Jesus speaks, he does not just point to a moral code for us to follow. He's not a mere preacher like I am. He points to himself as the one who changes lives. This is part of the uniqueness of the Christian faith. And this is part of the uniqueness of the power of the Christian faith. As far as I have been able to tell, every other major religious figure in all of human history who has had a powerful impact on human history has done one of those two other things. They have either come pointing to someone greater than they are or they have come pointing to a moral code that you should follow and not to themselves. But Jesus comes saying, I'm the one. He comes saying, I am God. Now, that's interesting. Look at it like this. When you and I read in the, the, our, our newspapers and our websites of someone who shows up somewhere in the middle of Florida and claims to be the second coming of Jesus Christ and has gathered a cult of followers around themselves, what do we think of them? The same thing that everybody but those five cult of followers think of them, right? And yet, Jesus came saying, I am God very God in flesh. And it works because it's true. Friends, this is part of the uniqueness of our faith. This is part of the unique power of the Christian faith. And friends, this is important for us to understand because when we begin to remove the utter and absolute uniqueness of Jesus Christ from our churches, from our congregations, and from our lives, what we end up doing is we remove the only power that makes any kind of lasting difference. Another thing that this tells me is that I do not have the right to tinker with the word Christian. I don't get to modify it. I don't get to change it. I don't get to set limits on it. It means I am a follower of Jesus Christ God in flesh. When Christ comes preaching, he comes pointing to himself as God in flesh. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So as the beginning of this ministry continues, Matthew puts it like this. We're going to pick up here now in verse 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Follow me, for I will make you fishers of men. So now in this passage, Jesus begins to call people to himself. He begins gathering disciples for the next few years of his ministry and even further than that. These four guys in this passage, the four of them are fishermen, and they're all there on the Sea of Galilee. A little bit later on, Matthew even tells us a little bit about his call, and um, that's a beautiful thing. He goes by it pretty quickly, but it's a powerful, humble thing, and Matthew's a tax collector, but these four guys are fishermen. Now, in their culture, here's part of what that means. Okay, they're fishermen, but that also means that their fathers were fishermen. That also means that their grandfathers were fishermen. It also means that their great-grandfathers were fishermen. Probably as far back as they know in their family history, this is just what they did. This also means that all four of these guys are there in the boats with their nets doing their work because they plan on being fishermen. And if they are blessed to have families, then their families are going to become fishermen. Jesus speaks, and they drop all of that, and they begin a completely new life in Jesus Christ. That's not a small thing to do. It's not as if they didn't like the family business, and so they had a hundred other options open to them. That's just not their culture. This is what they were going to do. But Jesus shows up and just says, follow me, and here's what I can do with you. 
and they immediately Matthew uses that word twice here he rarely uses that word but here twice he says immediately they drop their nets and they follow Jesus I want to think through a little bit because you and I are wrestling in our lives with what it means to follow Jesus with what it means to be a genuine disciple of Jesus Christ so I want to think through now what it means for these four guys to follow Jesus first of all their response is an act of sacrifice these guys leave one vocation for an entirely new vocation altogether they leave the business that they were involved in and they enter into this life of following this rabbi Jesus Christ and eventually into this life of ministry and apostleship and missionary work and church planting that becomes their lives now for these guys the call upon their lives is a complete change in vocation and sometimes that happens Christ calls and it just so happens that it changes literally the direction of our lives and we go in a different way believe it or not when I was in high school I thought I was going to become a chemical engineer some of you think you don't look at all like a chemical engineer I got a degree in economics and here I stand so many people asked me while I was going through college because halfway through college ministry started opening up for me when people would ask why are you getting an economics degree and I'd say I don't know but it's what God wanted and it served me well but that's what God did for me but statistically speaking that's a very small percentage of people but friends listen Christ calls all of us to follow him and every answer to the call of Christ involves sacrifice we sacrifice an old way of life and we begin a brand new way of life. The way Matthew writes this, it's abrupt. The language is quick. It strikes us because Matthew is trying to confront us with something. Their complete and ready response to Jesus should be a challenge to us. In their response to Christ here, there are no reservations, there are no half commitments, and there is absolutely no hesitation. Now, these disciples walking with Christ, and even afterwards, they still stumble and fall. There's nothing supernatural about them, but at this moment, Matthew wants us to hear this. There is no hesitation in the answer to the call, follow me. And that's important for me, I think, because of this. One of our temptations when we follow Jesus Christ is to put one foot in with Jesus Christ and keep the other foot out. To believe that what the world offers me is pretty good all by itself and that Jesus is some kind of added on luxury that I get to use and draw on when everything else becomes a little bit too much for me. He's a little bit like a data plan. <laughs> when I get to a certain point, I've used all I can, but he gives me even more. And friends, that's not sacrifice. That's selfishness. And let me tell you, when we treat Christ that way as a luxury add-on to my life that I activate every now and then, that I engage in every now and then, means that I am missing out completely on the life that Jesus Christ offers me. By way of illustration, let me talk just a little bit about something a friend of mine is going through, and what I mean by that is me. Okay. So I've got this friend. <laughs> Christ has been challenging me for a while now about what it means to trust him. Scripture likes to use phrases like this. In everything, trust the Lord. At all times, trust the Lord your God. And what I have discovered upon reflection is that I walk along through life under my own steam and strength and ability, and I will hit these moments where it is just way too much for Phil to handle, and then suddenly I'm starting to struggle with what it means to trust God. And you see, when I have done that, I have discovered that what I am doing is I have kept one foot in my abilities, and now I've reached this point where the pool's a little bit too deep for Phil, and I'm trying to put one foot in trust in God, and it's not the case. 
That all of a sudden I'm getting 50% benefit from trusting in God and 50% benefit trusting in me. Friends, let me tell you from experience, I'm getting zero from Christ when I treat it that way. I'm learning to hit those walls and walk backwards and trust God with the first breath I breathe in the morning. Then, then we begin to actually walk in the life that Christ has given us. No reservation, no hesitation. Immediately, I drop all of that and I begin to follow Jesus Christ. I hope things go well for my friend. (laughs) Their response is an act of sacrifice that challenges us. Their response is immediate. By this point, whatever it means for them to come to this point, we don't know. Matthew doesn't tell us because it doesn't matter. What matters is when they reach this point and Christ sees them, looks at them in the eye and says, follow me immediately. They drop it all and they begin to follow Jesus and the course of their lives begin to change. Again, friends, you and I are tempted to very slowly allow Christ in, (laughs) to slowly let Christ's life become one of ours, maybe when we deem it necessary, maybe when we feel like that's what's actually going to begin working for us. But again, the disciples challenge me. Their response is immediate. It is whole, it is complete, it is, in this sense, instantaneous. And then, friends, their response to Jesus is the obedience that is demanded by the call. I don't know at this point what the disciples believe about Jesus Christ. I don't know how much they know about who Jesus fully and truly is. As the disciples walk through Christ, or walk with Christ through the rest of the Gospels, these guys are learning and learning and learning what Jesus is. They're confused by who Jesus is. They don't even believe he's going to be killed. Then they don't even believe that he's risen from the dead. They just, they're, they're, they're growing in this belief. But friends, this moment is not a moment of now I have believed everything about you. Now I'm going to start to follow you. It's a moment of obedience. And it's a moment of obedience that's demanded by the call of God upon their lives. Their beliefs and their lives will follow, but it follows behind the engine of obedience to Jesus Christ. So notice again, we touched on this quickly, but guys, I think this is important. It is Jesus Christ who initiates the life of discipleship. Jesus calls you into his life. It is not the case that I somehow rise to some kind of level that makes it appropriate for God to go ahead and bring me into his kingdom. Christ goes to these guys. Christ came to this person. Christ walks into these lives of these men and women and calls you to himself. Discipleship is made possible by his call and his initiation. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his magnificent book, The Cost of Discipleship, put it like this. Discipleship is not an offer man makes to Christ. I don't give him my discipleship. But he goes on to say this. It is only the call that creates the situation. What makes this life in the kingdom possible is that Christ is the one who called me. And notice as well, and this is put physically in the story, as we sort of watch this story unfold, this physically happens. And what the disciples get to do, literally, you and I are learning to do in our lives. Their act of obedience puts them in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. They stop walking down the path of this life, and they literally begin walking down the path of this other life behind Jesus. So Jesus becomes the model for their lives, and he becomes the power for their lives as well. Bonhoeffer, again, in The Cost of Discipleship, says this, Christianity without the living Christ is inevitably Christianity without discipleship. And Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. To be a Christian, remember I said I don't have the right to tinker with the word Christian. 
Because to call myself a Christian, to carry that label with me, to put that bumper sticker on my car, means that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. It's just what it means. And then finally, this happens with them. Their response, this response of obedience, leads them into the only life that can actually transform the human condition. And let's begin to read in verse 23 to the end of the chapter. And, when, <clears throat> and he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And that sets up the Sermon on the Mount as a matter of fact. Their response leads them now to follow a man who does this. <laughs> Matthew tells us that Jesus goes through all of the cities, the villages of Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. We know historically that there's at least 200 villages just in the region of Galilee. So this is a lot of legwork that Christ is doing. And his disciples are watching a lot happen as Christ goes and as he teaches and as he heals the sick. And notice how Matthew describes it. It is the bringing of the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of what Christ can do in his rule and reign. This is what Christ is unfolding for his people here in this passage. This gospel of the kingdom, it comes with teaching and it comes with healing, both of them with supernatural power. We see this often in the life of Jesus Christ. He teaches. The teaching is important, because you and I have to learn what this new life really actually looks like. How different this life is from the other life. What it means to follow him instead of anything or anybody else. We have to learn what that actually means. And then it comes with all of this healing. The only thing that can fix and change and transform and heal the human condition, friends, is Jesus Christ. That's it. And the disciples are learning that in this powerful way. And May you and I learn that as we follow Jesus Christ, right? So friends, this morning as we hear Christ do this, as we hear Christ go through this, consider this your invitation to follow Jesus, to enter into his kingdom. I'm going to encourage you, brand new Christian, Christian for a very long time, ask Christ in sincere and repeated prayer to lead you, to become the one who walks before you, who guides you, who opens your heart to yourself, who transforms you. And in humility, ask him to do exactly that, to change you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. I learn the more I walk with Jesus, how much more I need to be and I want to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. I don't need any more of Phil. <laughs> I need a lot more of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and then, friends, just ask him. Put it in these simple terms. Just ask him for the kind of power that's required to live like Jesus Christ. And this is where things begin to change. This is where things begin to change for you. And this is where things really actually begin to change for those around you in life with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful again for this time this morning. We are grateful, Father, for all that we have heard, we have sung. We're grateful for this fellowship with the body of Christ. And we are thankful this morning for the words of Christ. We're thankful this morning for the call of Christ. These lives that would be lost in our own darkness, we sit in darkness, in deep darkness. We are not our own light. 
I cannot turn on the light that is needed to change this life. So Christ comes. God in flesh enters this life, this world, so that we may now see the light of God so that we may now hear the call of God to follow Jesus and to enter into His kingdom. Impress upon every one of us how the kingdoms of this world, the kingdoms of my own concoction, have left me wanting at every turn. Reveal to our souls, our hearts, our minds how the kingdom of God is light and life. How it is the teaching of truth. How it is the power to heal and to transform. In the name of Jesus Christ, reveal that to your children this morning. We pray all these things in the magnificent name of our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Friends, we're going to ask you to stand with us this morning. Before we go, I want us to sing a little bit of this song. And in prayer and worship, continue to listen to what the Spirit has to say to His church this morning. There is a king, and he rules over all of this land. Even mountains obey his command. He is awesome and powerful. Spoke into the dark, and he called every star into place. In his voice every symphony played The dawn of the universe He called my name Wiped away my shame He knew my daddy's fate Now Jesus Christ, that all of this is really true about. He really is God who walked into this flesh. He really is God in flesh who went to this cross. He really is the God who died and again rose three days later, defeating death so that we may have life. He really is God in flesh. This Jesus Christ, this kingdom is true. It is real. It is available. Father, we revel in that fact. We live in that truth. God, may it be the kind of thing that moves us and changes us and transforms us as we, with every step of our lives, learn what it is to follow Jesus Christ. Thank you for this time together among your family and in worship of your glorious name. Father, go ahead of us and your children every step of the way and lead us in the light of your truth. In your magnificent name we pray. Hallelujah. Friends, we're going to continue to sing and pray and worship you. Invited to linger as long as you like. Thank you for being here today. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. He called.